Okay, so um, for our last speaker of the session, it's my great pleasure to introduce Willem Jan van Hul from uh, Carnegie Mellon to talk to us um, about uh, decision diagrams. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to you all. I want to talk about decision diagrams in the context of uh, graph coloring uh, problems, a very classical optimization problem most of you will be familiar with. Um, let me just start by saying that graph coloring, um, the, the problem that I will consider today is uh, the vertex coloring problem in which we are given a graph. And the idea is you want to assign a color to each vertex in the graph so that adjacent vertices have different colors. This is a, a classical problem and, and, and the goal is to find the coloring to the uh, vertices that minimizes the total number of colors that are needed. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most important combinatorial optimization problems out there and, and decades of uh, work has gone into theoretical and practical studies. Um, it has indeed many practical applications as well um, in the context of rostering and scheduling, for example, they have really a direct mapping uh, almost to graph coloring, but it also appears as a subproblem in many other different applications. And so obviously people have developed um, methods to find exact solutions, optimal solutions, and most of these, well, all of these have to not only find the good solution, the primal solution, but of course they have to prove optimality uh, via good lower bounds. Um, you can think about good um, integer programming formulations, for example, for this problem, and, and, and there may be a couple, but not that many perhaps, but the most uh, effective one is one in which we do something specific in terms of not assigning, for example, a binary variable to say this vertex i is color j, so you would have a, a quadratic number of binary variables, but instead the most effective one is, is, is uh, one that, that actually talks about color classes, so you would color an entire class of vertices um, in one shot, and I have an example here, and um, here on this tiny graph that we have, we have a blue color class and a green color class, and um, these are subsets of vertices, that are not adjacent, so they would also correspond to independent sets. And rather than trying to find a MIP model that tries to assign a color to an individual a vertex, now we would assign, or our model would be pick a selection of these color classes, and they can be exponentially many, so that every vertex belongs to exactly one color class. You can also uh, make this constraint greater than or equal um, without loss of generality or without loss of optimality, so that's fine. Um, this approach um, is very suitable for a uh, column generation and branch and price technique in which you start iteratively generating these color classes uh, based on the LP uh, solution. And so the idea is that you would start with an initial set, perhaps just the individual vertices could be color classes that guarantees feasibility. And then you solve the LP and you try to find a new color class that has a negative reduced cost and can drive down the number of colors needed to cover all the vertices. Um, a lot of work has gone into that after this uh, original paper by Mirotra and Trick in 96. And uh, there, are there are very good codes available for this. And um, of course, there is no magic bullet, so this is not always going to be uh, scalable, but it is actually a very effective way of solving uh, graph coloring problems in practice. So the challenge here, there are several challenges, of course, when you work with branch and price. Uh, one of which in this particular application is uh, the exponential number of color classes that you might want to separate. Um, and what I do in this particular presentation and in this work is taking um, a dual perspective in a sense. Um, I would like to capture the exponentiality in a compact way. And rather than separate, then representing all these independent sets one by one as columns, I'm going to represent them differently. So now we'll switch gears and I want to mimic the same approach but using a graphical representation. And here is a graphical representation of all the independent sets of the input graph I've given you before. So we have here these uh, four vertices. What I'm doing here is I associate with every layer in this graph, one of the vertices. So we have one, two, three, four, let's go graphically ordered. And each node in this graph corresponds to the decision of either adding the vertex or not adding the vertex to your independent set. So this is not yet graph coloring. This is just representing the independent sets of the graph. And so for example, if you start at the root node here, I can select either vertex one to be in the independent set or not. And these will be the solid or dashed arcs uh, uh, respectively. And if you look, for example, at the leftmost path, I would select vertex one and then vertex two, 
and if you look at this input graph, obviously, if I done that, then I can no longer select three and four because they are adjacent. So the only paths remaining to the terminal are not selecting three and four. Now you can inspect that each of the paths from the route to the terminal corresponds to an independent set. You can also inspect that every independent set from the graph is represented in this decision diagram. This is actually a decision diagram. And this is, that is why this is an exact decision diagram. There is a direct mapping between independent sets of the graphs and paths from the route to the terminal in this decision diagram. So fortunately for me, um, has been, there's, there's prior work that shows how we can compile these diagrams in a top-down manner relatively efficiently uh, for independent sets. Um, you need to associate specific state information with each of these nodes in the diagram that allows you to merge identical, I should say, equivalent states. Because what's happening here is this, this is not just a simple enumeration that runs into exponentiality that directly, it may still be of exponential size, mind you. But you see, for example, in this first node in this layer, um, in the starting for, for vertex four here, you see many paths lead to that node. That means that the all the uh, paths out of this state are equivalent and we can merge um, the, uh, the, the subgraphs that are equivalent in this decision diagram. So this allows you to compactly represent an exponential set of solutions. But I just want to reiterate that this is not also a magic bullet. There still may be an exponential number of states needed to represent this decision diagram. So we don't get free lunch here. However, in some cases, for example, uh, cliques, um, exact decision diagrams uh, can be of polynomial size for the independent set problem. So that is, that, that is good news. Another interesting thing to note is that um, for a fixed variable ordering, um, in this case, one, two, three, four, but it, of course you can just pick any fixed ordering, uh, there exists a unique minimum size exact decision diagram. This is, decision diagrams have a long history in computer science for decades, and this has been very, very well studied. And that's one of the fundamental uh, properties of decision diagrams. So that's also good to, uh, to, to note. So given that we have all our independent sets right here in a fairly compact representation, now we can reformulate the uh, column generation model. And uh, rather than associating a binary variable with every independent set as we, done, uh, as we did for the column generation model, we now, are, we now want to find paths in the decision diagram. We don't want to find just one single independent set, but if you want to color the, all the, uh, the vertices of our input graph, we want to find paths that correspond to independent sets that really cover all these vertices now by these paths. So what I mean by that is we can define a flow model, if you want, by associating a variable Y, A with every arc A in this diagram. And here is an example of two color classes or two independent sets that together co uh, cover all the vertices in my input graph. So we have a, a blue and a green uh, color class here. And you can follow the paths to see indeed that they correspond to independent sets and that together they cover every vertex. So in every layer, we have exactly one, one arc um, being selected. So this indeed uh, corresponds to an optimal solution. Um, it is of course a uh, fairly easy e exercise to write out the, uh, the associated MIP formulation. Um, just to note that we want to minimize the number of colors. So we want to minimize the number of paths needed to cover all the vertices. So the flow out of the uh, root should be minimized. We also want to cover every vertex. So across the layers, we count the one arcs and they should add up to one. And lastly, but not least, of course, we have flow conservation. Um, but the last one is we need to have integer flows. And of course, normally for network flows, we have integrality for free. In this case, because of the side constraint that we need to have a set of one arcs across a layer equal to one, that ruins the, uh, the integrality property in this case. So we have to insist on solving an integer program. So that's the idea. So the idea would be to not use independent sets in an iterative way to populate a column generation model, but instead we want to use the exact or the uh, decision diagram to formulate this hopefully more compactly. So there may be a benefit to that. But obviously you probably of course recognize there are some challenges here. Um, first of all, even though exact decision diagrams may be compact, they may still not be provably polynomial. So they can be of exponential size. <clears throat> that can be an issue. Secondly, we solve a MIP model for this last application right here. We need to insist on integrality. So that is also, of course, FP hard and it is uh, complicating matters. To the first point, um, we can actually 
avoid using exact decision diagrams. We can use relaxed decision diagrams. And this is actually the content of this presentation of the work. We can find increasingly better and more refined decision diagrams that give you stronger and stronger lower bounds on the coloring number. This is the minimum number of uh, colors needed to, uh, to, find, to, uh, to cover the graph. To the second point, um, well, Yes, it's of course NP hard to solve this integer uh, uh, program, but we don't do anything different than, um, than the original column generation approach. They also have integer programs to solve. And in fact, we are not scared of integer programs anymore. MIP solvers scale very well. Uh, last talk of obviously uh, showed that uh, as well. Um, but if you really insist on having a polynomial bound, which I can imagine you want to, what you could do is you can say, I want to have decision diagrams that are only of polynomial size, that are relaxed. And instead of using MIP, I use LP. So I have a polynomial lower bound. Um, I'm not saying anything about the quality of the resulting bound, um, but you, you might in fact, um, but, but in this case, you would still have a polynomial, a provably polynomial bound at least, if you, are, if you insist on that. But again, in practice, I'm, I'm happy to run MIPS. So let's see how that works. And of course, I want to tackle the first application, the, the first challenge um, um, first, uh, how to handle these uh, exponential decision diagrams. So let me just specify and make a bit more clear what I mean with exact and relaxed diagrams. So I'm, I'm given a problem P, it's not necessarily a graph coloring problem, it can be any problem. And I have a decision diagram for this problem and I call this exact if the solution set of the diagram corresponds exactly to the solution set of the problem that was given to me. It is relaxed the diagram if the solution set is an over approximation. That means that in the graph that is the, I must say in the, in the decision diagram, all the solutions are present, but there also may be non-solutions. And here in the bottom, I have three examples. On the right, we see our exact diagram again. Um, and I have on the left, two examples of relaxed diagrams. The most left diagram is the trivial diagram. I have just one state in each layer, and I basically allow all possible tuples, all possible combinations of zeros and ones to be possible independent sets. So this is again a representation for the independent sets for my application here. Um, clearly, uh, this is a relaxation because it covers all possible permutation, all possible uh, tuples. So obviously, uh, all independent sets are also part of this. So it's definitely a relaxation. But there are also non-solutions. For example, the, the all ones path clearly violates the constraints. For example, one, three, it basically violates all possible constraints here. Now we can refine this somewhat. We can split nodes in these layers and we can try to um, still be relaxed but have a better representation of at least some independent sets. And this relaxation in the middle, um, you can verify this is indeed also a relaxation, but it's, uh, it's, it's more refined. For example, the rightmost path from, uh, it picks up one and two, but then it will recognize that three and four can no longer be selected and you only have the zero arcs left. So one and two indeed is an independent set. There are still non-solutions, for example, the solution um, uh, two and four is present here, but it is not, of course, allowed because it's not an independent set. So if that is going to be a problem, we need to further refine the diagram. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, I start with the simplest possible relaxed diagram, the trivial one right here, and I apply my um, graph coloring flow problem. I want to minimize the flow needed to cover all the vertices, um, by paths in this diagram. Well, it's trivial. It's just all one path uh, covering all these uh, vertices like so. And now I'm going to start from the root. I have my edge matrix and I'm going to see, I collect of course along the path, all the vertices that I have included and I see if there's any conflict. The first conflict we find is when I enter the arc uh, at layer three and I see that three is in conflict with one. That's a conflicting edge. I need to separate that. So I can do that by refining the diagram. How do I separate conflicting edge in this diagram, the conflicting edge one, three in this diagram? So what I'll do, I will give you a bit more information on, on, on what kind of state information I need to represent my independent sets. And, and here it is. Some of you who have seen earlier uh, decision diagram talks may, may recognize this. Um, as information I, collect, I represent the states is the set of eligible vertices. Those are the vertices that I can still add to my independent sets. So at the root, these are all the vertices. Um, but if I would, for example, branch on one equals one, I can no longer take three and two and four are the only remaining eligible vertices. Okay, let me see, I'll, I'll show you how this plays out later. Um, 
so for example, if I would go to layer to the to the to the next layer, one is no longer eligible, so I just are left with two, three, and four as the eligible vertices. Now these eligible vertices actually represent uh, the subgraphs on these uh, on these vertices. So to separate the conflicting edge from one to three, I'll start at the first vertex one, in this case that's the root node, and I'll follow the path that gives rise to the conflict. And I split off that path one by one, layer by layer. So I follow the path one, I split it off. I update the state and I know if I branch in one I, and I take it, I can no longer have three. So I will remove three from the eligible set. Now, in order to remain a relaxed decision diagram, I cannot throw out solutions. So that's why I have to copy the arcs coming out of the original state that I went into with my one arc. And I have to copy that to the new state. So basically I split off the entire state and I drag along its children. And I proceed layer by layer. So the next one will be again the one arc, I split it off. And in this case, if I branch on two be included in my set, I can no longer take four. So all that remains is the empty set. I follow the path, but there is no more one arc out of this state because I can take it, it's not eligible. The vertex three is not eligible from this state on. So the one arc cannot be taken and I am only left with the zero arc. This is the, then I terminate my process and I have resolved the conflict, okay? So this is the, uh, the basic step of um, compilation by separation, if you wish. Um, there's a few notes. If you do this, you can recognize immediately that at most I can increase the decision diagram with one node in every layer. So if I apply M edge conflicts to separate, I can grow the MDD, the decision diagram, at most M times the number of layers. So this is linear in the number of conflicts that I separate. Another note is that I may separate conflicts multiple times. One arc or one edge, for example, one three uh, appeared right in this conflict, but maybe it appears elsewhere in the process again. So don't be um, uh, confused that this gives you a polynomial size diagram because I have to separate multiple edges sometimes multiple times or the same edge multiple times. Uh, another thing that I think is, uh, is a good uh, consequence of this procedure because of the states that I represent, um, this compilation by separation actually gives you, in the end, if you were to separate all possible conflicts along any path from the root to the terminal, it gives you actually the same unique minimum size decision diagram. And, uh, and that's good news. So if you look at this uh, entire procedure, what we have, you start with this trivial diagram, I compute the flow, I get a lower bound of one, and I get the conflicting edge, which we just separated. I get, I will recompute my flow, I get a lower bound of two, I find another conflicting edge, I separate it. And I continue until I find no more conflicts. And then I conclude optimality. Now we can terminate at any point in time and we will, we will, will I'll, I'll, and I will give you a valid lower bound. But I can of course also run this until optimality and I might not need to generate the entire exact decision diagram. For example, this, this particular example shows you that. With the relaxation, we can already, uh, encounter optimality prior to generating the entire exact decision diagram. So how can, is there any hope that this might work? Uh, I'll show you later. I just want to analyze first what the procedure is doing. It gives you a valid lower bound in each stage. I just want to mention that the conflicts we can find by using a path decomposition of the flow. Uh, we go one, back one slide. Uh, you know, you can, you can apply a standard path decomposition to pull out these two paths that I indicate here. Um, and they will be, that can be done in polynomial time. Um, we get an exact solution if we have time and we run it all the way to exactness in, at the worst case. And we can never go worse or can, can, go, can go beyond the exact diagram. So these are just some uh, initial analyses of this algorithm. So is there hope that this might work? Yes, there is hope that it might work. In fact, there are, there's an instance class that gives you an exponentially smaller the relaxed decision diagram than the exact decision diagram needed to represent all independent sets. Um, and this is for me personally very important because if there, if there was no such a result, then um, I would be very hesitant to apply this in practice. So just to make it a bit more clear, what I, in order to prove this and maybe to specify a little bit more detail what the theorem says is there, is ex there exists this graph coloring instance class that if I give you, and I also affix, uh, affix the vertex ordering, that the exact diagram that you would compile would be um, exponential sized, 
and the um, relaxed decision diagram can prove optimality already with the polynomial size. And here is the, uh, the, uh, the class. It's a path of uh, length n. Uh, for technical reasons, I choose n odd, but that's not at all important. And the idea is that along this path, when you construct your vertex ordering, you want to delay adjacent vertices as much as possible. So I split out the ordering among even and odd um, uh, uh, labeled uh, vertices. And uh, up to the midpoint, what I'm going to do, this is for example, 13, n equals 13. I will, I will separate um, at least with a distance of two, and exactly distance of two in this case, the, the labels of the vertices. So I go from one to three to five and to seven so that they are not adjacent and I cannot do any inference in the top half of my decision diagram. Uh, I fill in the gaps with the uh, larger numbers coming from the, from the other side of the path. So 13, 11 and nine. And what happens actually after the midpoint is not so important. I use here a symmetrical ordering, but it, it can be anything in fact. What this does, it gives you um, at least two choice points for every state in the top part of the diagram, which gives rise to an exponential exact decision diagram. And I'll show you later, and you can probably see it uh, immediately uh, already in this particular case, that the relaxed decision diagram only needs to separate one conflict. And let me show you the, uh, the example for a path of length seven, which is of course pretty small, but on the left, I have the exact diagram with the two paths indicating uh, a solution. These are all the even and the odd labeled uh, vertices. And on the right, we have the relaxed decision diagram, but we just split one edge. It gives you a lower bound of two um, um, immediately by design. Uh, and of course, this is also the optimal solution. And uh, since it is a relaxed decision diagram, the optimal solution is also included in the decision diagram. And so the path decomposition can find that, for example, here. It doesn't have to find it, but in this particular case, I expose it. So this is sufficient in this particular example to prove optimality with just a diagram um, of size n, basically the number of vertices, whereas the um, exact diagram needs exponential number of vertices. So that's good news. Okay, five minutes or so, Willem? Uh, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm almost done, thanks. Um, so how does this work in practice? Theory is fine, but of course paths are uh, easy. So let's see what we can do in, uh, in, in, in practice. So I implemented all this, used uh, CPLEX as my LP MIP solver. Um, just for people that are interested in it, um, I do apply first an LP relaxation before I run a MIP uh, uh, model. So the MIP model is NP-hard obviously, or in principle, um, and it is just slower than applying LP. So, that, so that, that's probably the most important one that I added as, as, a, as a design choice. I also separate multiple conflicts per iteration. So I apply this to all Dimex instances. Clearly I can find lower bounds on these. Um, I didn't report all of them. Um, I will do so in the extended version uh, of the paper. I just wanted to highlight a few things in this, in this talk. Uh, first of all, I think it's interesting to see um, if there's any practical indication that these relaxed diagrams can indeed be better than exact ones for, for, for finding solutions. And, and indeed, this, look, this only gives you a lower bound, right? But if you let it go long enough, you can actually prove optimality. Uh, especially if, if you have a reasonably good um, desatter based, for example, heuristic bound already or primal solution. Um, now, it turns out the heuristic is not that great in many cases, but by itself, actually, the decision diagrams used in this way in the vanilla uh, application can find optimal solutions quite often. And let me just fast forward there. 47 instances uh, out of this benchmark are already solved to optimality. Um, just by using this lower bounding procedure. And at some point you just conclude because there's no more conflict. So um, without any outer search or primal heuristic, this already gives you uh, pretty uh, impressive results for me at least, um, but you know, I'm biased. Um, and 44 of those were solved within one minute and 32 within one second. So this is, this is, this is nice, I think. Um, but to the point of re exact versus relaxed the sizes, and here's a plot in which you have a log log plot in the, in the uh, size of the exact and the relaxed diagram. And uh, the, of course, the, the relaxed diagram can never go beyond the exact ones, which should be below the, uh, the diagonal axis here. But in some cases, you can have orders of magnitude, smaller relaxed decision diagrams to prove optimality. For example, for this particular one, DSJR 500.1, um, the exact diagram needs at least 100,000 nodes, and I terminated that at that particular cap, um, whereas the relaxed one only needs 626 nodes to prove optimality for that instance. So that, that I think is, uh, is very promising. Uh, my last slide is on, the, uh, on some open instances. Um, on some of these, well, these are fairly large, so um, I think what is very interesting is that for some of these, 
we can find bounds that are matching uh, the lower bounds from the literature um, within, you know, within a second, which is uh, remarkable, uh, in my opinion. Again, I am biased. Um, and then for C2009, uh, I found a lower bound that is, has not yet been reported in the literature. Um, as for, and I tried very hard to find anything that, that reports anything or anyone uh, reporting on the C2009. And, this is, I, and I couldn't find anything that's, that, that's better than this uh, lower bound. Um, so that is, uh, that, that's also good news. So that shows you that um, there is uh, some promise in this, uh, in this technique, at, at least. So to summarize, this is an interesting alternative to find lower bounds for graph coloring. And it's fairly generic. Separation, of course, can be done also for other applications. And I know that some other people are working on similar applications using separation um, for decision diagrams. Um, in this case, we, we get stronger bounds by iteratively ap applying that. Um, theory says we could be exponentially smaller than the exact decision diagrams. Practice says we actually observe this in, in some cases, in several cases. And there's also an improved lower bound for this one instance. And, and let me stop there and, and thank you for your attention. All right, I encourage you to give this wonderful talk all of the uh, kudos it deserves. And then I'll ask if um, people have questions. I have one. So uh, do you use some heuristic to determine a, a vertex ordering to, uh, before constructing the decision? Yes, yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> what I do is, um, um, of course, when you do your vertex ordering, you, you, um, you, you collect a set of vertices that have been already um, selected before, and you have to pick from the vertices that are not yet selected, which is the next one to include. So what I maintain is a score, a count on what is your connectivity with the set that has already been picked. And I'd use uh, the degree, a max degree as tiebreaker. And that's actually, uh, the vertex ordering is extremely important for this application. Other questions? I have a quick question and maybe it's, um, so is it actually obvious that that particular constrained uh, flow problem is NP hard? Because that's a pretty special looking graph where you're just picking in this layered sort of graph that just one of those edges, or is it obvious that somehow this is subset sum or something like that? Uh, uh, it, actually, um, it, it depends on your definition of uh, it being obvious, but okay. I, it's not I, I thought it was interesting enough to add a small lemma in the paper that proved Oh, okay. So you, you proved it. Okay. But in you fact, was... it, is, it is subset sum. Oh, I'm, I have great intuition. Or I read the paper and forgot about it. I can't remember. Other uh, questions? Uh, Ahmad has a question. I see you raising uh, your hand. I'm glad everybody. Go ahead. Yeah, but I'm a co-host. I can raise my virtual hand. So, um, okay. <laughs> Uh, it, that was a very nice talk, Well, Thank you. Um, I have a question. Do you think any sort of graph symmetry would help uh, the decision diagram or would it actually make it worse? That's a very good question. I would want it to help. Um, in general, symmetry can really help you identify sub, sub parts of the space that are equivalent. But given the vertex ordering, um, I don't think it will help you to know that, say, subgraph on nodes one through k and uh, one prime to k prime uh, are the same because they will be ordered differently in the diagram. So I don't think, I don't see that that can help you immediately. That it may be possible to do a graph transformation uh, or somehow I uh, use a smaller graph that captures the same structure and you build a decision diagram for that smaller graph. That, that might be useful. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? I don't see any in the chat and no blue hands. Okay, well then I invite you all to uh, thank uh, Benjamin Domenico and Willem for uh, a great, uh, I really, it's a, uh, I thank the organizers too. It makes me so happy when we have great computational oriented talks and IPCO to sort of round out uh, this. So I think this was a great addition to the, to the conference.
And uh, Giacomo, uh, I don't have any other, do I have to tell people other things? Uh, no, uh, let me just remind everybody of the uh, Slack workspace. I just uh, put the link again in the chat, but that's it. Thank you. Oh, okay, well, I'll see you on the other side and see you in uh, Slack. All right, Hopefully see you all soon in person.